You found a podcast where you'll hear the truth, and we will praise Jesus' name. We stand for the Bible and won't back down from it, although it don't bring much fame. Some folks will like it, some will try to deny it, but God's Word will always stand true. It's been tried in the fire, still good. Hello, friends and faithful listeners. It's time for the Pot King Bible Study. I'm your co-host, Donald King, and I'm joined by the host of this study, Brother Donnie King. On this podcast, we study the Bible from its original languages so we can understand the Word of God more clearly. We look at current events and light of Scripture, and we also examine some of the things going on within our culture from a biblical perspective. This is Monday, April the 29th. Episode number 166, Many Believed, But Not the Leaders, John 11, 45 through 12 and 5. In our last episode, Jesus had arrived, and he observed everyone weeping and crying over Lazarus. So Jesus asked where they had buried him. They took him to the place, and then Jesus began to weep too. The Jews were amazed that he wept, and then they reasoned among themselves if Jesus could have done something if he had been there. They got to witness firsthand what Jesus could do, for he did something no one else had ever done before. He called Lazarus from not only the tomb, but from the dead. We believe this is such a stirring episode, everyone needs to hear it. So come on and listen to it today. In today's study, we begin on a good note, for many of the Jews began to believe on Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead. This caused the chief priests and Pharisees to get together and conspire of how they could get rid of him. Interestingly enough, the wicked Caiaphas prophesied to the group, and then they all began to get ready for Passover. Jesus is eating with his friends from Bethany, and then a woman comes in and anoints him with some costly ointment. This riled some people, and things are about to really get going. Come on and see what you think of today's episode. Now for the teaching of God's Word and the lesson for today, turn it to the host of our podcast, Brother Donnie King. Well, thank you for making a great choice today. When you chose the Pod King Bible Study over Glenn Beck, Ben Shapiro, and Joe Rogan, you made a very wise decision, we think. <laughs> <laughs> what if they listened to one of those other shows first, though? Well, then the audience would know that I'm not as much of a Latter-day Saint as Beck. I'm not as Jewish as Shapiro, <laughs> and I'm not as foul-mouthed as Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I hope not, but I do think they have come to the right place regardless. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. This is where the Bible is promoted, Jesus is exalted, and we pray that people are blessed. That's right. You know, some people might be shocked at the thought that we pray over these studies, but I believe we should pray over everything. As a matter of fact, if people would pray first, there's some things they probably wouldn't do. I'd say you hit that one on the head, and you probably hit a few nerves as well. (laughs) Well, you know, it bothers me when I see the lack of prayer in this generation as a whole. We're starting to see our older prayer warriors slip away from us, too. Yeah, that's true. Well, this causes me to wonder who's going to replace them. That's a very troubling thought, and it's disturbing when you look at it from that angle alone, but I do have some hope. Oh, you do? (laughs) What do you base your hope on? Well, you see how many listeners we have on the Bible study, and if that many people are interested in studying the Bible, I believe there's just as many people who pray. I guess I never thought about judging this by these metrics, but it does make sense. Thank you, Lord. You just gave me some hope in this generation. See, we've already helped one person today on this podcast, and hopefully you're just the first among many. (laughs) Well, it would probably help a lot more people if you quit your stalling and got started. (laughs) Okay, you have to throw that in every time, but I guess I will. we got to start at some point, don't we? (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and read John 11 and 45 and 46, and then we'll make some comments. We know that Lazarus has just been raised from the dead, and many of the things that had happened here was shocking to everybody. So let's jump in at 45 and 46. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. As with all things, there were some who liked what happened, and there were some who didn't really like what transpired. Some rejoiced about what was going on. A dead man had come to life and this was caused to rejoice. And this caused some of them to believe on Jesus just because of this. Yeah, I know it, but a few of them become adult tattletales. This made some of them hate Jesus more than ever before. It really did. We read an encouraging report by John from many of the Jews believed. And we've seen this before. If you need two quick examples, go back to John 2 and 23 and go back to John 8 and 30. 
But I want you to notice something here in verse 45 in chapter 11. John specifies that it was once the Jews saw what Jesus had done that they believed. Well, that makes sense to me. They had to see to believe, similar of some of us today. Yeah, but having faith is much better than having to do it this way. Despite the wondrous miracle that Jesus had just performed right before their very eyes, some of them went to the Pharisees and gave them a report. Yeah, they told them what Jesus had done. I believe they did this for more than informational purposes. I believe they had a motive deep down within their wicked hearts. That's true. And that ought to cause us to stop and take inventory of our own hearts right now. If you or I had been there, would we have rejoiced and believed on Christ? Or would we have snuck off like they did and told the religious leaders what was going on? Well, you might would have told the Pharisees on him, but I I would have believed. Oh, well, thank you. (laughs) Well, let's look at verse 47 and 48. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Once the Pharisees were fully informed, they and the chief priest held a private council meeting. Well, the Sanhedrin gathered together with one purpose in mind. They had to figure out a way to get rid of this man. They sure did. This just causes a question to scream from my very innermost being. Why? Why were they doing this? Why did they want to get rid of him? What made them so bent on destroying him? Yeah, you know, it is crazy because they wanted to kill him since he raised Lazarus from the dead. Yeah, they desired to do away with him because he had brought a man back to life so his sisters could rejoice over him and in the Lord. But how can you kill the life giver? (laughs) Did they really believe they could kill a man who could raise the dead? Yeah, that's a good question. How do you go about killing somebody who gives others life? That's right. (laughs) Well, they reasoned among themselves, though, and they began to ask, what do we do now? I mean, where do we go from here? This man is doing a lot of miracles. Well, why would they want to stop miracles from happening? This is really disturbing when you think about it. It is. This was the religious leaders who were trying to stop miracles from happening. You would think that the religious leaders would be wanting miracles to happen if anybody did. Yeah. They began to talk. Hey, if we leave him alone, then I think everybody's going to end up believing on him. If we leave him alone and let him do what he's doing, eventually the whole country is going to believe in him. Well, what difference would that make? Well, it would basically break down their little happy house that they had and their little kingdom they were building. They explained a little bit of their reasoning process in their next statement. They said the Romans are going to come in and they're going to take away our place. Now, think about that. What they're saying is the Romans are going to come in. They're going to take away our power. They're going to take away our position. They're going to completely rule over our nation. If we let this one man get by, Rome's going to see that we're weak and they're going to take us completely over. So really, national pride seems to be at the heart of their hatred. Well, that might be, but, you know, religious pride is just as real. They knew they were in danger of losing their power and their prestige in high positions. That is true. And what a shame. They were willing to kill a good man, an innocent man. And actually, if you really want to put it where it is, the greatest man who had ever lived just to keep what they had going. In the phrase, when they said, if we leave him alone, we find a lot of meaning right here. The Greek word aphelman is used. It's a form of the Greek word aphiemi. It means to allow something to happen, to let something happen, to permit something to happen. And it's also used from a position of power or authority. They felt like if they allowed him to continue to do what he was doing, it wouldn't be good for them. So their only option was to stop him somehow. (laughs) Did they really think they could actually stop him? You know, the implication I'm getting here is that they had allowed him the freedom to act, but now they were going to take away his freedom. Yeah, the very one who sets everyone free, they're going to take his freedom from him. Just like the life giver, they're going to take his life from him. It wasn't just his freedom they planned to take away. Preferably, they planned to take him away, or at least his life away from him. In John 11, 49 and 50, one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It's right here for the first time in John's gospel. We see the character known as Caiaphas brought into the storyline. Now, historians say that he had been installed as the high priest somewhere around six months prior to this by his father-in-law, Annas. He remained high priest for somewhere around 18 years. John says he was high priest that same year. How was that possible? 
Well, it could be understood in two different ways. One, the same year that Lazarus was raised from the dead, Caiaphas was the high priest. Okay, historians record that this really was true, but they also tell us that this was specifically said because for the first time ever, two men were the high priest at the same time. Well, no, wasn't this against the law from the Old Testament regarding the priest's office? Well, it most certainly was. And and we see this mentioned again in the book of John that they were in office the same year. Let's go back to John 18 and 13. Let me get this. All right, right here it says, And they led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. So this isn't talking about Lazarus being raised from the dead here. We know that that implication is there that, oh, it could be talking about the same year Lazarus was raised from the dead. Caiaphas was also high priest. Well, that's true, but that's not the point being made here. The point being made is there was two men that was high priest in the same year. So Caiaphas began to tell the Sanhedrin over which he presided. He's the head of it. The high priest is the leader of the Sanhedrin. He told those that he was leading. You don't know anything at all. Yeah. What a compliment from your leader, your head or your ruling authority. Ain't that the truth? Don't that make you feel good about yourself? Oh, yeah. Imagine morale really boosted at that point. <laughs> he told them, he said, you haven't even considered what is expedient or necessary. It is necessary that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation. Well, I know some people would think this as Caiaphas was waxing scriptural here, but he prophesied the death of Christ. Yeah, and technically in our verse, verse 51 right here, John himself says that this is a prophecy. So do you believe this corrupt man really gave out a prophecy? Well, let me explain a couple things. I'll answer it, then I'll explain it. I believe it was, but not because God showed Caiaphas things that were to come. I believe God used the murderous desire of this high priest to conduct the sacrifice of his only begotten son. So God was sovereign in what was happening here, and Caiaphas's feelings actually portrayed what was really going to happen. So it's formed as a prophecy in that sense. Well, you know, it's just hard for me to see this as a prophecy because the man prophesying is so wicked. The one prophesying is not even remotely a prophet, according to his lifestyle. No, and I agree with what you're saying. I really do. But I think Caiaphas said it this way. Let me rephrase it, and I think it may make more sense for you. It would be much better that this man die for the people rather than the whole nation be taken over by Rome, and then all of us will die. What you're saying that he predicted something that would happen. And this was a prophecy. Yeah, a lot of times people look at a prediction and a prophecy as the same thing. I can predict that it'll probably rain one day this week. If it happens, does that mean I prophesied or I predicted something? <laughs> you know, I can say, God showed me it's going to rain this week. And then when it rains, it looks like I made a good prophecy. Yeah. Just because a wicked man says something that happens doesn't mean that God moved on them by the spirit of prophecy and gave them a prophecy. He made a prediction that basically was prophetic. You see what I'm saying? He was calling for the death of Christ is what he was doing. He wasn't really given a word of prophecy as the Holy Ghost moved on him. Just because he was wicked and had murder in his heart, that didn't really negate the fact that it was also a prophecy that it had to happen. To me, this actually shows the sovereignty of God on full display. Amen. Caiaphas' plan for murder fell right in line with God's will for his son to be crucified for the sins of the world. This proves another scripture correct right here. Had the princes of this world have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what 1 Corinthians 2 and 8 says. Paul knew this. He knew that if they would have understood what was going on, they wouldn't have allowed Jesus to have died on the cross. Caiaphas used the Greek word sympharo. Sympharo means profitable. He said, hey, it's to our profit. It means to be beneficial. We'll benefit by the death of this one man. It'll be to our advantage. Okay, what he was saying, it's better for the common good that we at least kill this one man instead of we be taken over by Rome and all of us die. So what he's saying, it'd be better for us if Jesus died rather than any of us or all of us. So they thought they would benefit or profit or be advantaged by the death of Jesus in the end, these leaders didn't receive any kind of benefit from this. No, as a matter of fact, it pretty much sealed their fate. Even though Jesus died, that they might be saved. I really believe that Caiaphas and Annas and Herod and any of those, if they would have repented, I believe they could have been saved. They just would not do it. All who believe on Jesus and what he did, all of us have benefited greatly. We've profited much and we found a wonderful advantage. 
They didn't get any benefit from it, but we sure have. That's right. All right, let's look at John 11 and 51 and 52. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Our beginning phrase in this verse right here is very intriguing to me. It could be taken in a total opposite direction. Now, how in the world can that be? Well, John says that Caiaphas didn't say this of himself, which almost sounds like John is making sure we don't think Caiaphas was the man that should die. I personally don't believe this is even remotely on the radar. Caiaphas didn't speak this of himself, especially if this was a prophecy. Yeah, I'm with you for this was said by Caiaphas, but it did not originate with Caiaphas. God placed that thought in his mind, and he said it as it needed to have been said. Well, Caiaphas will have no excuses when he stands before the Lord on that great day of judgment. No, that's true. And that also reminds me of something Jesus said back in Matthew 7. Hang on just a minute. Let me pull this up. Matthew 7, 21, 22. Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? So it lets me know that there are some who have prophesied, but they still were not right. You know, Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus must die for the nation of Israel. But then he took it further and said it would not be for the nation of Israel only. That's right. When he died, he would actually die for everyone, as we see yes. so clearly throughout the scriptures. Matter of fact, let's take a minute, and I want to show you a couple of scriptures that it proves that Jesus didn't die just for the Jews, and he didn't die just for one group of people or two groups of people. He died for all. Let's go to First John 2 and 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus would gather together all the children of God who were scattered abroad. We find that in numerous places in the Old Testament, but I'll limit it to two in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23 and 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again unto their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Did you notice? I'm going to gather the remnant of my flock from all countries. They're coming from everywhere. Jeremiah 31 and 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it to the isles afar off and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doeth his flock. He's going to bring all of the sheep together at one point, no matter where they're from. John 10 and 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You know, I guess I shouldn't struggle with God using a wicked man like Caiaphas to prophesy. You know, it's kind of similar to Balaam in the Old Testament. They were both used by God to say things that needed to be said. You know, that's a really good perspective to view this from because there is some similarities there, and that's a good point. Let's read John 11 and 53 through 54. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Well, John tells us what the council members did and also what Jesus did from this point. You know, immediately after this meeting that Sanhedrin had, they were actively conspiring of how to put Jesus to death. What great godly men these guys were. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> they were trying to concoct the perfect plan, but they had quite a bit of trouble pulling it off. Yes, they did. As a matter of fact, it seems that every time Jesus did a notable miracle among the Jews, they sought to kill him. Go back to John 5 and 16. Go back to John 9 and 16, John 9 and 22, John 9 and 34, and John 11 and 53 that we're looking at right here. And we understand that every time he did something amazing, they said, we got to kill him. Yeah, Jesus quit openly going among the Jews at this time, and he went to a country near the wilderness. His public appearances began to be fewer and farther apart. That's true. Some question if this is where John the Baptist had been early on. Matthew 3 and 1 told us in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. It's a possibility that's where Jesus may have went. Could Jesus have returned to the wilderness of Judea? It's possible, but no one really knows. No one really knows where the country named Ephraim even was at that point in history. The Greek word that is translated here as country is really closer to a city than it is to a country. Oh, really? You, you know, that's interesting because most of the time historians and scholars can locate places like this pretty accurately. Yeah, and some of them believe that this is speaking of a town that is better known as Afra, 
which was 16 miles from the Jerusalem area. So we really don't know exactly where he was, but he went somewhere and was staying for a little while. Okay, well, either way, Jesus and his disciples stayed there for some time. That's right. That's all we do know for sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's finish up chapter 11. John eleven fifty five through 57 says, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should shew it that they might take him. So once again, we see that the Passover is near. Most of the people had been leaving their homes in the country and they were heading into town for the big celebration. They were all coming into Jerusalem early so they could purify themselves for this holy ritual they're about to go through. You know, the people were steadily on the lookout for Jesus. They were standing there in the temple, and they asked one another if they thought Jesus would come to the feast or not. It must have been common knowledge what the Pharisees and the chief priests were up to. They had given a commandment that if any man knew where Jesus was, they must tell them. They intended to take him if he showed up. That's right, and this caused the people to question, well, what would Jesus do? Would he skip this feast? Would he bypass the Passover just to save his hide? Was he really afraid of the rulers? Yeah, they were wondering if he'd let them all down. Uh, There was not a chance. No, he is on his way, and as they were questioning each other, he was headed that way at that very moment, as we'll see (laughs) in the next chapter. Let's go ahead and start into John 12, and let's look at verse 1 and 2. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. I love how John gives such detailed information. What part are you talking about? Well, at the end of the last chapter, he told us that Jesus had not been going among the Jews. And he also said the Passover is drawing nigh, and the Jews were wondering whether Jesus would make an appearance or not. And John now says Jesus showed up in Bethany six days before the Passover. And then he reminds us that this is where Lazarus, who had been dead, actually lived. Well, you know, they made supper for Jesus. And once again, we see Martha serving, as in Luke 10, 38 and 39. That's right. And that's where things get a little interesting because Matthew 26 and 6 and Mark 14 and 3 informs us that this meal was had in Simon's house. Simon is also called a leper, but we know that this must be something from his past. Well, now how do you know that for sure? Well, lepers were not allowed to live in the city along with everybody else, so they couldn't have been gathered together with somebody with leprosy. They were relegated to live outside the camp and they were to cry out to the people who came near to them, unclean, unclean. Okay. If that's the case, then this tells us that Simon had obviously been healed from his leprosy. And this just points to Christ again. For who else do you know who could heal leprosy? (laughs) Yeah. This would also explain why Jesus was invited to his house in the first place. I agree. And I think that is a very logical assumption. Simon was also called a Pharisee back in Luke 7 and 39. And to me, that makes the whole setting so very odd. We have a family that Jesus is very close to who is doing the serving. They're doing the visiting. And they're doing the anointing. But all of this happens at a man's house who was connected to the Pharisees. To top it all off, he'd been a leper at some point. Now talk about a good plot line. Yeah. (laughs) You know, John makes sure that we know Lazarus was sitting at the table with the Lord. But wouldn't you have been sitting there too? (laughs) Yeah. They couldn't have pried me away from the one who raised me from the dead. Ain't that the truth? Let's look at verses 3, 4, and 5 together. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? At this point in their festive gathering, Mary takes a pound of ointment of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus. Yeah, well, you know, she rinsed his feet with her tears and then wiped them dry with her hair. John said this ointment was very costly, and even Judas declared it to be worth 300 pence. Yeah, and pence was the Greek denarius, which was a day's wage. So technically, this is 300 days worth of labor. That's between 10 to 12 months worth of wages for the common laborer. Hey, I've got a question for you right here. Okay. Where did Mary come up with this kind of money? Where'd she come up with this ointment? Well, that's a really good question, and technically we don't know, but you can kind of piece together some things, but I don't know if you'll like the conclusion it comes up with. 
Women were not allowed to work alongside men back then. It had changed from the time of Ruth where they would work in the fields together. And now it's kind of changed by this time in the culture. They couldn't work beside men, so she had to come up with her money some other way. Some women would sell their wares, their food, their pottery, maybe even make some trinkets, sewing items, and such stuff like that for extra income. Maybe this is how she came up with the money or the ointment. Well, I've heard some people say that she may have been a harlot before she met Jesus. There isn't a lot of evidence to prove this, but there are a few things that point to this. Well, and I've heard that also. And really, I can't deny it. I can't put my approval on it 100%. But to me, the greatest evidence is found in Luke 7 and 39, where Simon seems to know what kind of woman she was because he thought Jesus had to be clueless. Let me read you Luke 7 and 39, the last part of the verse. Simon was thinking and said, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. What does Simon mean when he thought within himself? If Jesus knew what manner of woman this was that was touching him. Well, the implication is that Jesus should have known what kind of woman she was if he was a prophet. He wouldn't have allowed her to touch him if he had known what kind of woman she was. Now, we're just simply told that she was a sinner. We're not told what her sin was. We're left to guess, surmise, and even assume what her sin may have been. Yeah, but we could even talk about the box or the thing holding the ointment because harlots were known to wear perfume flask around their necks. Yeah, and I, I have actually read that in history. They would wear them, and it's surmised that she may have taken this flask that was her perfume bottle to cover up the stench of her sin and would break it, and then all of a sudden that aroma filled the house. So think about it this way. If that's really so, when she broke that flask, it would have shown her allegiance to Christ because she's making a clean break with her sordid past. And so she's letting that that used to be what defined her and identified her. She's getting rid of it while at the same time taking all of her earnings and giving it to Christ, laying it at his feet literally. Either way, we do know that this ointment was highly valuable. Yes. It gave off a fragrant odor in so much that it completely filled the house with its aroma. That's true, and there's been even a lot of speculation as to what the spike nerd or the ointment was. Some translated as perfume, others as aromatic balsam wood, and some as genuine nard. Others still yet say that it was probably some kind of aromatic medical compound. So really, nobody knows for sure what it was definitely, but we got a good idea. It cost a lot of money. Yeah. John, once again, makes sure that we don't forget that Judas is the one who would betray Jesus. The wording of this intrigues me so. For he is the one which should betray him. It almost sounds as if it had to be this way. Yeah, and the Greek word is what gives us a clue in this. And I've heard a lot of people use it to go either way. You know, there's really only two camps on Judas. Some believe he was right, and then he backslid. Some believe he never was saved. Okay, now I understand Each party believes very strongly in what they stand on. But let me show you what this means. No matter what camp you fall into, and the Greek word where it says that he should betray him, now it sounds like that it was definite that Judas had to be the one to do it. But the word here, should, means about to, going to, impending, or soon to occur. It can just speak of something that is fixing to happen, which means it didn't have to happen. It was just simply going to. Okay, well, that does make some sense there. Judas finally speaks, for he'd seen enough. This was more than he could actually bear. Why didn't you sell this ointment instead of wasting it on the Lord? (laughs) Yeah, don't that sound nice and holy? Well, I'm sure that when he said it, he was trying to sound a little more pious with it, and he didn't say it as blatantly, but that's what he was saying. Yeah. Why didn't you give this to feed the poor? Well, you know, Judas only cared about himself, and we see that he valued his life over Christ. And the Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. It most certainly is. And you think about it, whatever sin that is out there, the most deepest, darkest, vilest sins, there's money included somewhere with it. You either have to pay to do it, pay to get it, or it costs money, or you make money from it. Either way, there's money involved in every sin somewhere. And Judas, he was worried about the poor, wasn't he? He was worried about poor old Judas. That's what he was worried about. And right here, the root of evil, the root of all evil, we can see that those roots of evil were everywhere all over this ground that is known as Judas. Once again, that proves that sin will cost you. 
All right. We got a question in here today. I think it's going to be a good one. I like good questions better than just questions. <laughs> All right. Here it is. I'm going to see what you do with this one. Okay. Is it wrong to read the daily horoscope? My husband has been trying to convince me it is some form of devil worship or something, but I don't see anything wrong with it. We both listen to your podcast some, and we want you to weigh in on this subject. Okay. Well, thank you, number one, for being a listener uh, somewhat, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're listening to this one where you can hear your answer. Thank you for trusting me to give you a response on this issue. I do appreciate that. I take that in high regard. What would I have to do to get you to become full-time listeners? <laughs> give a good answer. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it is. On a serious note, reading the horoscope is not under the classification of devil worship, but it can be traced back to it in some forms. Okay, now I understand. You don't feel bad about it. Your husband says you ought not do it. Number one, let's just say if you were going to be a submissive wife, it would be best to listen to your husband in this matter. Your husband has some reasoning here. We need to look at some things. It may not be classified as devil worship, but I can trace it back to where it leads to devil worship. If you have read your horoscope today, this does not equate to you going out sacrificing a black cat to the devil at midnight. Okay, I understand. It's much different in what's being done, but who's it being done to and who's the root of this? I believe it's the opening up of yourself to be influenced by spirits that are not good. That falls under the category of sorcery, black magic, and witchcraft. Let me ask you another question, and I hope I understand the answer to this is going to be no before I ask it, but please let me ask. Would you play with a Ouija board? I sure hope not, and most Christians would recoil in horror at the very idea. Would you go visit a fortune teller and allow her to use tarot cards to tell you the future? Where is this woman or this person getting this knowledge from? When they tell you, oh, somewhere in the next few months, either they're completely faking their frauds and you're wasting your money, or they're getting some kind of knowledge from some kind of spirit somewhere. Now, I know some say, oh, there's nothing to it. It's harmless. How harmless is it? When they try to summon spirits, really? I mean, you don't think that those are good spirits, do you? This woman who's not a Christian or this person that's not a Christian, you think they're going to call the Spirit of God up and make the Spirit of God tell them what's fixing to happen in your life? Do you really believe that? And if you say, no, I don't believe that, then why would you listen to a fortune teller? Why would you read your horoscope? Because that's the type of people who do horoscopes. Is sorcery only a fluke? Is there nothing to it? Is it all just a bunch of stuff that just n nothing to it? Then why do you go in the first place? Why do you read those things in the first place if there's nothing to it? Is it legitimate? So do these people truly know the future? Do they truly know what's going to happen through this week and through tomorrow? Do they really know a month in advance what's going to happen in everybody's life just because you're a Leo or just because you're a Sagittarius or all of those other zodiac signs? You've got to answer, where are they getting this supposed knowledge from? It's got to come from somewhere. It's either coming from heaven, from earth, or from hell. A lot of people say that's just earthly, fleshly stuff. If it's of the earth, if it's of the flesh, the Bible says if it's of the flesh, it's of sin. Now think about that. We know if it's coming from the devil, it's already wrong. But if it's coming from the flesh, it's wrong. It's got to be coming from God to be right. These horoscopes are not coming from God. The sorcery that is done is not coming from God. So now, horoscopes fall under the biblical category of those who studied the sun, the moon, the stars, and then, guess what? They did. They worshiped the sun, the moon, and the stars. They worshiped the host of heaven, the Bible says. The astrologers and astronomers of days gone by watched the heavens so they could worship. They were literally worshiping the things they saw going on in the heavens. They believed that the moon had a god on it. And so they worshiped the moon god. Guess what? His name's Allah. They worshiped the sun because there was a god of the sun, and the sun god is Ra. So when you worship the constellations and the stars, guess what? The stars in the Bible are referred to as angels. So do you worship angels? Guess what? Satan is a fallen angel. If you worship an angel, you could worship the devil. Do you see the connections? I hope you do. I hope you can see this. The Bible condemns all of those practices. And it's not right to do any of it, not any part of it, not even checking your daily horoscope. Is your horoscope always right? Can I ask you that? Has it ever missed it? Can I tell you if it was wrong one time, that's enough to classify the person who's doing it as a false prophet. All you have to do is miss one prophecy to be declared a false prophet. 
Not because your husband is a man, and I am a man too, but this time I must take the side of your husband because he's taking the biblical side. Could I advise you? Leave it alone. It is of the devil. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to send you a list of scriptures that will show you what is wrong with all of these things, and I hope that you at least take the Bible's word for it if you don't take mine. Amen. Brother Donnie has a good answer. All right, friends. Remember, if you have a Bible question or a question regarding how news, current events, or things going on in our culture are connected to Scripture, drop us an email at dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. That's dkministries1977 yahoo.com. We hope you've enjoyed this episode today, sharing God's Word. But until next time, may God bless you all. Be sure and come back next Friday, May the 3rd, for special edition number 130. Have you seen him? He's done so much for me, this I know. Will he change my heart all around? Put my feet back on the ground, got along. Now for heaven I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. To that land where the milk and honey flow. Oh, I've heard of such a place. I can't go there by God's grace. Never seen it, but I know I want to go.